My mom used to say that you can understand somebody's situation a whole lot better if you walk a mile in their moccasins. Now, I don't know why she chose to talk about moccasins rather than shoes, but the principle is one that we all know is true. When we, well, when we take the time to understand where somebody is, we can understand a whole lot more about where they're coming, what they're coming from. You know, the same thing is true when we study through the Scripture. Certainly, you can have a good understanding of the Bible uh, just by reading the text that's provided. But we live in a day and time where we have the unique opportunity and advantage to know so much more about, about the places and about the people and about the history that surrounds the stories that we find in Scripture. And understanding where those people walked helps us to understand a lot more about why they said and did the things that they said and did. You know, the same thing's true with the life of Jesus. This evening, I just want to share a passage of Scripture that's found in Matthew, the 16th chapter. It's a pivotal time in Jesus' ministry when Jesus is, is beginning to kind of transition from an introduction to His ministry into the heart and to the meat of what He plans to do. And He wants to know, well, He wants to know who people say that He is. If you have your Bible tonight, you're welcome to turn with me or scroll to it on your phone. We're going to be in Matthew, the 16th chapter, as we begin in verse 13 or so. And Jesus says this. Let me just read it to you. It says, When they came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he said to his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And so they just kind of laid out, you know, some of them, they obviously recognize you're a great teacher and more than just a great teacher, Jesus. You've got to be one of the prophets or maybe the great revival leader, John the Baptist, who had recently died. But Jesus was most concerned about what they thought. And so he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, Peter was good at, well, Peter was good at sticking his foot in his mouth, wasn't he? But in this moment, he was given a moment of brilliance. And his answer was, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in verse 17, of course, Jesus was ecstatic. And he said, Peter, you get it. And you get this because it was revealed to you. And then Jesus goes on to make a powerful proclamation. He says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, not Peter, but on the rock of the statement that, G that Peter had just made, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on to say, whatever you bind on earth will be bound on earth and whatever oh, in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And, and I want us to focus on this part that comes right uh, before that. He says, you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know, there's a little context clue that that kind of starts out at the beginning of this passage. And for many of us, we probably just read through it over the years a number of times. It says that when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, there was something special about this place, Caesarea Philippi. It's actually a place that we know where it is today, and it's actually a beautiful nature reserve today. It's been a spot that tourists to the Holy Land have gone and visited for a very long time. When Mark Twain went on his famous trip through the Holy Land in the 1860s, Mark Twain visited this place, and this is what he wrote. Let me share with you his, his writings. He says this, he said, Scattered everywhere, there are paths in the paths and in the woods are Corinthian capitals, broken pillars, and little fragments of sculpture. And up yonder... In the precipice, where the fountain gushes out, are well-worn Greek inscriptions over niches in the rock, where in ancient times Greeks and later Romans worshipped the god Pan. What he's describing, Mark Twain is describing there, is, is what lies beyond just this little rippling brook that, that, you, that first greets you when you enter this place. It's a massive cliff a hundred feet high and five hundred feet wide, and right in the center of that cliff is a gaping cave filled with dark, dark waters. In the ancient world, the ancient believers believed that 
or the ancient people believed that this was, in fact, the gateway to the underworld. This abyss was the place where all souls went when they died. And guess what they called it? <laughs> they nicknamed it the gates of death, the gates of hell, the gates of Hades. It wasn't by accident that Jesus said what he said in response to Peter's statement. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. No, it was, it was very, very intentional. No doubt the apostles and certainly Jesus were well aware of where they were in this, in this, this place and its significance. As Mark Twain reminds us, there was the worship of Pan there. Pan was an ancient Greek god that was half god, half goat, and his position, among other things, was that he guarded the entrance to the underworld there. He was worshipped by a great number of people. In fact, the ruins that you see when you visit there today were built by, built by Herod the Great about 20 years before Jesus was born in honor of his Caesar, Caesar Augustus. Herod was quite a builder. In fact, he built three different temples in honor of Caesar Augustus. This one here in Caesarea Philippi. He also built another one in Caesarea Maritime and then another one in Samaria area nearing his, his home capital. But the important part of this is that Jesus was referencing the ancient belief that death was, well, the finality for everyone. In the ancient times, the, the ancient people would offer sacrifices here. They would throw an animal sacrifice off of this tall cliff into the dark waters below. And if the sacrifice sank, it was accepted and pleasing to the gods. And maybe they would, they would get a stay of the inevitable death that would someday visit them. But if it floated, well, the gods had not accepted the gift, and they would offer yet another. All around that area in the cliffs, there's little niches that are carved out that were not just to worship Pan, but to worship other gods as well. Pan, of course, was one. Nemesis, I believe, his father in ancient Greek mythology. There was a, a, a sanctuary to a, a cult of the dancing goats, and in fact, just to be honest, this beautiful place today was a very wicked and sinful place in that time. It's interesting that Jesus chose to bring his followers to this <laughs> very wicked place to make this great proclamation that he was the Christ, that he was the answer to the problems that, were, that were, uh, had been a part of human uh, existence from the very, very beginning. Jesus was really saying, I am going to be the Lord over death. Aren't you glad that Jesus conquered death? Aren't you glad that tonight we can read through this text and have complete hope that even when our eyes close in this life, that there's someone that's really there waiting for us? It's ironic that Pan, this god who is supposed to kind of guard this place and, and sort of help people's transitioning through the underworld, he himself is the only Greek god that we know of that died. It was right around this time, somewhere between 14 and 37 AD, that the rumor began to spread, spread by a fisherman or a sailor, that he had received a vision that Pan had in fact died, had been sucked in by the abyss himself. Jesus, too, would, would go to Jerusalem, and ultimately he would die. But we know that Jesus didn't stay in the grave. Just as he had forecasted, had he, had, he had prophesied, three days later, he arose from that grave, and his resurrection gives us hope and confidence that this life is just the beginning of an extraordinary story that will follow us after this life. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 55 and 56 or so. It's really a statement of, of victory. He says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. He's saying, We all have blown it. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And just like Eve's initial sin in the garden led to death, our sins also lead to death. But in verse 57, he says, But thanks be to God that he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're right, Peter. And upon this principle, I'm going to build my church. And death, and all the rumors, and all the, all the skepticism, and all, all the superstition in the world, they're not going to overpower this hope that I'm bringing into this darkness. Paul writes to the church in Rome, in Romans the 8th chapter, one of the most powerful examples of hope in the New Testament. He asks this question. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger of the sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. It's it's interesting that Paul here kind of searches his memory bank and tries to come up with every kind of bad thing that could happen, many of which would happen to the church in Rome in the persecution that would come ahead. But he answers it in verse 37, and he says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There's a great many things that can separate us from those that we love and things that we love in this world. But Paul said, I am confident that there is nothing that can separate us from God's love for us. Today, if you go to Caesarea Philippi, you can still see the cave. It's deep, foreboding waters are still there. You can see the ruins of the shrines and of the temples that were built in that place, stones scattered around. But the kings who built them and whose honor they were built have long since died and are now just written names on the pages of history. And the gods that were honored there Well, those gods have all been relegated to folklore. And the temples and all their beauty and splendor and might are simply a few stones that are scattered around, as Mark Twain noted, here and there around that site. Their former beauty and majesty, well, lost to history and time. But the church, the church that Jesus described, the church that Jesus said he was going to build, on a rock of a statement that Peter had made, that Jesus, in fact, was the Christ, the Son of the living God, that church is still alive and well in the world today. The power of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is still changing lives. And everywhere there are people, people are being reached through the words of the, of the, of the New Testament, of Scripture, and the power and the working of the church. The gospel of Jesus Christ still reaching and changing people's hearts and lives today. Now, throughout history, a lot of people have come up against the church. Certainly, the Roman government and the Greek government before that had tried to oppress God's people. Throughout the Middle Ages, various entities would would try to squash the church. And even in our current era, there are many who have tried to push the church out out of the narrative of common life. But the church remains strong. Followers of Christ continue to share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because as Jesus said, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against this. Nothing in this world can destroy the great work that God has started here. And so tonight as we think about Caesarea Philippi, today a ruins, a story, we recognize that it was against this backdrop of a very wicked and evil city that Jesus chose to make one of the most bold and hopeful proclamations of all the New Testament, that I am the Christ, and that I have come to build a church, a church that is going to remain active and working in this world until I come again to call her home. Tonight we are, well, we're in a place where we're not able to gather together as we normally do, We're not able to worship as a church family on a Sunday morning. We're not able to gather for small group or large group Bible studies as we would like to and and study the scriptures together. But let's not lose hope. The church is still very much alive and well. Jesus is still very actively working in the world. 
through the efforts of Christians like you and I on social media or through churches that are posting material out there. Maybe people that have never heard these things are getting a chance to see them. Through our service to our friends and neighbors, the people that are around each of us, whether it be through a phone call or going and grabbing some groceries at the store for those who are shut in, the work that Christ put us here to accomplish is still happening. And hearts and lives are being changed. Pan might be a forgotten figure of history. Herod, the great builder, most of his buildings are in ruins. But Jesus, his church, remains strong and pushing forward. And will do so, I am confident, until Jesus calls us home. Hope these words have been encouragement to you tonight. I hope you have a great week. Be the, be the salt and be the light to the world and places where God has called you to allow, allowed you to walk this next week. We thank you guys for being with us. God bless and have a great evening.